Hello everybody, happy October and welcome to the evolution of horror. Now I know that we are currently, technically speaking, in a sort of mid-season hiatus. We've stopped our mind and body series for the time being, but I couldn't ignore the fact that this weekend is the release of one of my favourite horror movies that I've seen in this past year, The Brilliant Saint Maud, directed by Rose Glass. So we're bringing you a little bonus episode to discuss the movie in depth. Now later on in this episode you'll hear my discussion discussion with the brilliant Rosie Fletcher as we discuss our spoiler-free thoughts on the film, so you can listen to that conversation even if you haven't seen the movie. But for people who have seen the movie, or people that want to be spoilt, the spoilerific half of mine and Rosie's conversation will be available right now on Patreon. So if you want to hear the full in-depth spoiler chat, you simply need to head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror and get yourself signed up. But here on the main feed, the spoiler free discussion is available. But first of all, before we discuss the film, I got the chance to sit down and chat to the writer and director of St. Maud, the brilliant Rose Glass. Now, just a quick note to say that we did this conversation over Zoom and the audio quality isn't as great as it could be. Uh, Rose Glass didn't have a microphone, she was just using a computer, she was in quite an echoey room, so we've done the best that we can with the audio, but apologies in advance, some of the audio is a bit dodgy. Uh, But FYI, this conversation with Rose Glass will be completely spoiler free, so anybody can listen. So here is my conversation with the brilliant Rose Glass. Okay, I'm very excited to be joined by the writer and director of St. Maud, Rose Glass. Hello, Rose. Hello. Hello. Uh, how, how has this crazy year been for you so far? Weird. I mean, <laughs> it's in, in, every, in every way. I mean, the obvious weirdness that everyone's been experiencing and the year or so before that was weird already anyway because I got to make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> which is incredibly surreal feeling already so to be honest when this happened I was kind of like okay yeah fine sort of I mean awful but accepting stuff it's been a strange kind of long journey hasn't it in a way for, for this film because I first saw it at London Film Festival 2019 right so it's been like a sort of a whole year um, how has that been for you just kind of having this film just sort of simmering along I suppose all this time I don't know I mean it's uh, I'm definitely counting my Lessons with it. Like, if we had to release a film now, I think we'd have some quite a nice um, experience of it. And in a way, having a bit of a break has been uh, nice because it was all a bit overwhelming. So, I think we, we had our, pre- our festival premiere like two or three weeks after we finished post production on the film. Oh, wow. And that's when it kind of got picked up by distributors and then, you know, suddenly going to America and all this kind of Yeah, so it all got a bit crazy quite quickly. And then we were gearing up to go to America. And I was getting really nervous and freaked out about it, but then sort of sorted, sorted myself out and was like, okay, let's do it. And then, then it all got cancelled. Aside from, aside from uh, originally expecting to be doing, you know, press for the release of St. Ward, apart from that was the planning on just carrying on writing anyway, which involved being a bit of a hermit already. So in a way, lockdown hasn't had too dramatic an effect on my day-to-day life. Fair enough, yeah, fair enough. Um, so, so uh, first of all, just sort of set the scene for us. Tell, for people who don't know anything about this film, tell us a little, a little, uh, a brief rundown of what they can expect from St. Maud. St. Maud is a psychological horror film about a young nurse called Maud, who is, she's a private living carer, and she goes to care for her newest patient, Amanda, who's this kind of retired, fabulous, quite intimidating dancer who lives in this house by the sea. And she, Maud's a devout Christian, got a weird, intense relationship with God, thinks that he's sending her secret signs and signals, and she's kind of his um, servant on earth. And she gets it into her head that she's been sent to her newest patient, Amanda, to save her soul before she dies and sort of help her to also just find the light of, of God. Um, and so she embarks on that mission, and it, it goes wrong, or not very well, um, or things get complicated, I'm not sure. But she, yeah. Yes. Amanda, sort of, yes. I don't. I, mean, I, I considered it up to that point, and then I'm really bad at explaining. That's enough, though, right? <laughs> I think that's enough. I know you don't. You don't want to give away too much, right? As well. Um, I'm glad that you you kind of started off by calling it a psychological horror film because that was actually going to be a question for you. I was going to ask sort of how much you consider this film to be a horror film. I mean, is it is it a horror film in your head? Yeah. I mean, I, to, be, to be honest, it's like I. It is a horror film because it's scary. Like it's, I've seen audiences watch it. It's got scary bits in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's definitely got a flavour of, 
of that kind of thing. I, I mean, to, to me, I I don't really care that much without wanting to sound a bit about what genre it is. Like to me, it's sort of more. I always thought of it as kind of a dark, messed up, hopefully fun character study. Yeah. Um, but it definitely veers into into horror. I don't know, but yeah, now there's been so much of this, like, oh, is it a horror? Is it elevated horror or not? I hate <laughs> elevated horror because it sounds really snobby. It's, I get the differentiation. Like, if, you, if you're going to the cinema and you want to watch um, insidious type horror, you know, which is its own thing and great and very effective, you know, if you want jump scare, jump scare from the beginning, then maybe it's, it's not going to tick that box. But um, for me, I'm more interested in just dread and slowly building to, I always thought of it as more like a um, pot boiler, what do you call it, boiler pot kind of pressure cooker thing. I definitely wanted people, that was deliberate all the way throughout, I definitely thought of it as like uh, mounting tension and dread and oh god, is, are we meant to be scared of this girl or for her? That was kind of um, what I hoped would will keep people hooked. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Tell me, um, did are you kind of a horror fan yourself? What's been your own sort of personal relationship and history with the horror genre? I love horror. I'm kind of, you know, like Rosemary's Baby is one of my, it's pretty much my favourite film of all time. Um, but that said, that said, I'm finding having now gone to more like genre festivals and sort of being interviewed more for like proper uh, genre genre crowds i don't i'm a i'm a crap horror cinephile basically i don't i don't think i've got the credentials there's a ton of stuff i haven't seen um i mean a lot of the films in my head that were sort of washing around in my head when i was watching the film which maybe would have been more of an influence aren't necessarily horror films i mean apart from sort of you know obvious kind of like polanski repulsion rosemary's baby stuff um you know i was thinking of like travis fickle in taxi driver just in terms of like how a character sort of sees himself and I thought there was a bit of a link more there and uh, in like Bergman films which aren't horror films but they've definitely got a kind of like tone and sense of foreboding and uh, ominousness like um, in The Silence and Through a Glass Darkly and whatever and then, uh, then um, another big one was um, The Devils by Ken Russell which again I'm like is that, is that a horror film? I don't know like it's I mean to me, like if that's horror films, great. Like it's it's kind of it's sort of shocking and bombastic and and sort of very dark and grip. But it's not like a film I felt scared watching ever. So I'm not sure. Um, no, totally. I I 100 get what you mean. And and this film has such a feeling of dread you know such a palpable atmosphere um it's interesting i went to see it with one of the times that i've seen it i went to see it with a friend who she was saying that how great it was to watch a horror made by a woman and she said that she could tell even if she didn't know that it was made by a woman she would have been able to tell just by watching it um which i thought was really interesting i I just wondered what your thoughts were on that and also i wanted to ask you you know what it was like for you growing up as a female horror fan did you feel that there weren't uh, stories that were being told, uh, stories that you could connect with, or were, or did that not occur to you? It honestly didn't occur to me. Like, I think I was sort of aware from a young-ish age that there were more dudes who directed films, but I didn't. I don't know. I I kind of feel, I'm honest. I'm coming up. I'm quite fortunate in my timing, and no doubt benefiting massively from you know all the really important kind of work and. and discussion that's been going on within the industry and people kind of coming up at a time just when people are actively kind of wanting to hear more female voices so I feel like I've benefited from that to be honest but um I don't know I, to be honest I kind of I, I don't know I can I can there's plenty of male characters in cinema I can connect to as well I like to think that audiences kind of have the ability to connect with people outside of their own gender and experience. If anything, that's kind of the whole strength of cinema is that it kind of it can put you in someone else's shoes and give you a window onto their into their life in a way that we can't in reality. So um and and loads of great classic horror films have female leads as well, like Carrie and Rosemary's Baby, Repulsion and all these ones I'm mentioning. Um so this idea that it's kind of like radical for a woman to be doing a horror film or for, or for I mean I know those were directed by men or for female characters in horror is somehow revolutionary. To be honest, I don't know if I agree with, but um but I feel sometimes that maybe that's the wrong answer but no yeah. not at all not at all i just wondered because you know yeah you're right there are, there have been tons of horror films in the past about women carrie R- rosemary's baby number, but they're all made by blokes right and and i guess it's and, and it's interesting i mean it's probably i can i can't really 
it's hard for me to say and it's probably hard for you to say because you made it as to whether or not this is different in any way to those films because it has got uh, a woman's perspective behind the camera you know um but it's interesting because it is getting that response which is a really positive thing totally and i'm sure that there's you know things to do with my perspective on life that maybe are different to what, but you know all films are made by individuals and everybody brings them yeah in kind of thing to it i mean i guess maybe that I, I get the impression that maybe it's that people think maybe there's something in you know those in maybe before always seeing women in horror films as being sort of helpless victims and being terrified and sort of um either being the total source of but the thing is like Maud can like in some ways is a victim as well but she i kind of i like the idea of having a character who sort of is both the source of fear and the person who's afraid so sort of have a scariest place to be um, but again, I don't know if that's kind of never been done before. And like, it's weird because like Carrie wasn't genuinely wasn't something I was sort of thinking about as I was writing it. But then when people started mentioning it, when Maud got released, which is bad, um, I sort of went and revisited. She's a very, um, you know, sympathetic character in many ways, but also terrifying. And, totally. Uh, yeah, no, I get that. And tell me a little bit about that. Um, the, the character of Maud, finding the character of Maud, you know, because she does strike that balance of being sympathetic, but also really terrifying, right? And tell me about the process of writing Maud and working with Morpheth to, to sort of create the character of Maud. It was fun. I mean, that, that, like I said, from the beginning, that, I knew that the sort of film I wanted to make was essentially like a sort of deep dive into this one woman's mind and um I don't know it just sort of gradually evolves I'm writing it I like anti-heroes I like sort of characters and narrators and films where you're not sure if you can trust them or not um mm-hmm. and I think that's more I think that's more realistic um of humanity anyway um but yeah it, it, you, it's weird when you're writing you think you've got such a clear idea in your head like I can see this character they're so three-dimensional I'm Boba and then then you actually get a really amazing actor come along and read it and actually is perform it and you're like, oh, this is much better. Like, you know, they, she brings like a hell of a lot to it, obviously, but she, um, I don't know, what was just brilliant. I, I, I was just like a bit of a gushing idiot. But, like she's, because the characters in every scene in the film, like pretty much every shot and the whole thing just sort of, we knew the whole thing would completely fall apart if, if you don't kind of buy into her or if she's not someone that, that the audience en- enjoys watching, even if she's doing some pretty morally reprehensible stuff, like you need to, we need to still like her and be sort of intrigued by her. And more of it's just got this, she's just incredibly versatile um, and can sort of switch between all these things at the drop of a hat. She's super, very like natural and effortless in her performance, which I think is, which I, and same with Jennifer who plays Amanda. And that was, I think, particularly something that I loved about both of them, the sort of effortlessness of their performances, because, you know, you probably guess from like some of the references I talked about and the film you've seen it, like some of the tone is very, theatrical and like bordering on campy in some places and quite sort of big and stylized so I I wanted to get somebody who could make could really ground the character in like a really um natural kind of plausible emotional reality tell me a little bit about I mean I find it really interesting the way that the film kind of handles um religion I suppose and religious imagery and I, I you know what what and I just wanted kind of where that sort of comes into it and what your own history is with you know Catholicism Christianity and the stuff that's sort of portrayed in this film um I I went to a sort of Catholic convent or girls school right until about 16 I think um and some of, you know a couple of my teachers were nuns and we you know go to mass every week and say prayers and all this kind of stuff and my dad's dad was a vicar well, he died before I was born but you know would go to church with family on special occasions kind of thing so so personally I was never like a devout Christian and my parents never kind of forced it on me but Christianity was very like much around growing up and like the sort of symbolism and iconography and stories that go with it and rituals are very familiar and I think because of that I kind of didn't I wasn't particularly interested or I didn't think I was it was kind of probably typical of a lot of people who sort of grow up with religion kind of being a sort of an automatic part of their life you kind of just find it quite boring and like oh I just can't I don't want to go to church this afternoon um so I thought I was really keen to get away from it and then and then I don't know I think maybe once I sort of left home and uh got a bit older then had a bit more distance from it looking back I started to get more interested in I guess like the psychology of, of faith and like why it is that some people believe and others don't and what 
and wondering, like, as somebody who, who didn't think they believed in God, sort of wondering what it is that so many people get out of it. And I don't know, now maybe coming around to the idea that um, people just call it different things, God. Like, I'm still I'm not religious, particularly the sort of idea of any greater power having any sort of moral say in what you do or opinion, I don't believe. But the idea of there being something else that we don't understand and can't, possibly, don't, can't fathom yet, which maybe binds things together in some way. Never thought I'd say that, but yeah, I don't know. It's weird, I'm less of a staunch atheist now than I was before I started doing more, to be honest. Right, that, that's what I was, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. You know, we, we did, did this film come from a place where you were very much coming from a sort of atheist perspective, I suppose, when creating your character? Yeah, definitely. But, I, but at the same, but the, to be honest, in my head, it didn't really have, the story never really had much at all to do with organised religion. It was because Maud's version of Christianity is one that she's very much uh, created herself. Um, and it's quite warped and specific and definitely is massively crossing over with um, some quite severe mental health issues, um, which I know is like made some people like, oh, that's so offensive. But I think, I'm not, I don't, I don't think the film is anti-religion. Um, not that you ask that, but sorry, a lot of people have. Um, it's, I guess I was kind of interested in the sort of Venn diagram crossover of between faith and mental illness, um, which obviously are separate entities, but there's definitely some kind of crossover, which I find quite interesting, just in terms of wondering what, um, I'm not even just mental illness, but like the, sort of the psychological aspects of faith and, you know, I wanted the film to work for people who don't believe in God and to still get what she, to still understand what Maud gets from her relationship with God. And I think the idea of having a kind of narrative going on in your head, which is sort of must be addressed to somebody or someone, even if you just think it's yourself, like, you know, I kind of feel like whatever that is, the idea that someone else or something, even if it's just another aspect of your own psyche, is kind of listening and observing everything you do. A lot of people probably a bit wanky. Um, but then uh, that's why I kind of made it so that throughout the film she has these kind of orgasmic, ecstatic um, kind of episodes where God communicates with her and the idea the sort of suggesting that there was some kind of link between sexual ecstasy and religious ecstasy seemed quite interesting, but as in uh, waffling. No, not at all. Not at all. It's fascinating stuff. Let me ask you before we get wrapped up, um, where are people going to be able to see this film? How, what kind of a release is it getting? Yes, it's going to be in cinemas across the country on October 9th, which is next Friday. Amazing. How do you feel about how do you feel about it coming out in cinemas right now in 2020? I mean, it must be, I suppose, a lovely thing to, to know that it's going to be seen on the big screen, right? But I guess also a bit bittersweet given everything that's happening. I mean, we're still getting it on it's uh, the fact that we're still getting to release it on the big screen is, is great. So I, I'm counting my blessings on yeah. this stuff. It's, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's, it's very, I, to be honest, I kept feeling like, you know, the whole thing of like finishing the film and going to festivals and getting it picked up and doing press and stuff, that all felt like such a big, weird thing already. So in my head, it sort of kept feeling like it's already happened, but I keep forgetting it's not come out and most people haven't seen it. Um, so that would be strange. But it all started to become a little bit more real recently. Like, I don't know whereabouts your base, but like I just walked past Hackney Picture House the other day and saw like St. Maud stuff all over the front. So that's quite amazing. A... Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. <laughs> So exciting. That's so good. Um, how has it been for you? You said you've been writing through lockdown. I mean, um, let me ask you a, a, a sort of double question here. Like, are you planning on doing more horror after this film? And also, has this year's situation, has lockdown, has a pandemic in any way kind of influenced your writing or sparked any creative ideas or inspiration, I suppose? Um, in terms of the horror stuff, I've got a few sort of ideas that I'm kind of at various stages. One of them's kind of body horror, I guess. But again, Amazing. probably in the same way of Maud in that it's, I don't know whether saying not 100% horror, if that's a good thing. I need to come up with a better phrase. <laughs> anyway, there's, there's horror-tinged bits. I think I'll, I'll always be interested in telling stories that probably um, kind of have at least one foot in something a bit macabre and um, sinister just because I find it fun. Um, and the lockdown stuff, I don't know, I, we, I did write a draft of something in lockdown, which I had the idea of already, so I didn't come up with it in lockdown, but as I was writing it, I realised that it's another one with basically one person in a, in a flat, quite a lot of it. Um, so that probably helped. You know, 
But to, to be honest, then I started thinking about all the script writers across the world who are in lockdown at the same time. <laughs> I just think of like lockdown related uh, stories. So in a way, I kind of um, turned away from it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I suppose once now that now that we've had like the film Host, for example, it's like yeah, I was talking so... to about that. So like I knew him from before, and I was kind of like, it's great because that, like Host is brilliant, and like I can't believe what he managed to do in fucking lockdown it's amazing i was messaging him just like how did you do that but, like, the fact that he's got out there first i think it's great um, <laughs> and it's done now <laughs> yeah exactly but now well like maybe now there's going to be a slew not just in horror but just in of kind of like oh the pandemic thing and what was that one wasn't that meant to be like some american film recently where they're all sort of doing interviews on zoom um anyway yes yeah yeah absolutely well rose thank you so much for joining me and um, my final question to you which i ask everyone what's your favorite horror film Rosemary's Baby. Oh, lovely. Why, why, why Rosemary's Baby? I know that's an impossible thing to ask why your favourite is your favourite, but... It's, uh, well, I, know it's, I think it's just my favourite film overall, probably one of them. I don't know. Amazing. It, it, it ticks every box for me on a cinematic level. Um, I love it a lot. It's fun and scary and beautiful and awful and um, just beautifully made, I think. So, love it. Great. Amazing. Rose, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. We nice to talk to you. A big thank you there to the wonderful Rose Glass. Now it's time to get into our in-depth discussion of St. Maud. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the following conversation you're about to hear with Den of Geeks' Rosie Fletcher is a completely spoiler-free discussion. But for people that do want to hear the full in-depth spoilerific conversation, that is available on Patreon right now. But here is the spoiler-free half of my conversation with Rosie Fletcher as we begin our deep dive of the brilliant Saint Maud. Rosie Fletcher, hello. 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 This is weird, isn't it? Not being able to do this in person with, you know, a glass of wine and, you know, yeah. enjoy, relaxing. <laughs> weird. And also being able to see my own face is a bit disorientating. <laughs> <laughs> it's never good, is it? How sick of Zoom are you now after this? I mean, I love it and I also hate it. And th- there's that particular kind of um, strange moment when you're waiting for somebody else to sign in, particularly uh, when you're doing an interview, which Michael, you must have had the same experience, where you're just staring at your own <laughs> face. It, it, that would never happen in, in the real world. But you're like waiting for a celebrity to come on board and all you're doing is like, have I, have I got oh, a mosquito bite on oh, my face? It's so awful. And also the um, the moment when the other person does sign in, but their audio hasn't turned on yet. So you're kind of just like looking at each other. And then there's the, the moment at the end of the meeting when everyone's kind of waving goodbye and you're trying to press the end end meeting button. <laughs> yeah, because of course, there's the, you press leave and then you've got to press it again. So you're like, bye, 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 bye. <laughs> oh, God, unbelievable. But uh, how is everything else for you other than that? Has 2020 kind of been okay for you so far, all things considered? All things considered, yes, it's been fine. I mean, like, it, it, obviously I'm missing cinema terribly. Um, I've been once to see Tenet. Uh, and actually, I've been twice to see Tenet, because Tenet. Um, <laughs> but other than that, not at all, really. Um, but there's a lot of good TV, I suppose. Like, you know, it's, it's a good habit. And I, th- I honestly feel like I'm, like, consuming more media than ever, because now I'm at home all the time. Like, I never sort of not listening to a podcast or watching the telly even when i'm in the bath it's like oh put my laptop on the side and <laughs> yeah. you know it's like constant barrage of uh, of media it has been a godsend hasn't it because actually yeah the last time we spoke was about the invisible man and that was one of the last things i saw at the cinema i think yeah, yeah, know, yeah. back in the day yeah gosh Sometimes. So um so we're here to talk about saint maud finally i mean yeah. i don't know about you i saw it uh, LFF 2019 I think and I think I've now seen it three times but it's like Gosh. it feels like it's the film that I've been waiting to talk about for so so long you know um what about you when was the first time you saw it do you remember yeah it was at the start of the year it would have been like February uh-huh, uh-huh. Maybe. yeah uh, and and then it was due to come out in April yes and so yeah it's been like a year of and I think it was going to come out in America in I want to say July. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's been yeah. a year with me chatting with the PR going, I'd like to do an interview with Rose Glass. I and they're like, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. And us talking about, because we said back in February, like, oh, we'll definitely yeah. talk about it. And, and then every month since then, it's been like, yeah, at some point, we're going to talk about that film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> here we are. Here we are at last. Um, so we'll maybe we'll do a little spoiler free chat, first of all, like we did with The Invisible Man. We won't give away too many plot points. And then we'll maybe have a bit more of a spoilery chat and talk about some of the kind of craziness that happens in the final act uh, in the second half of this discussion. So first of all, Rosie, just to sort of set the scene for us, tell us a little bit about, without spoiling too much, what is the kind of the broad strokes plot of uh, of St. Maud? Yes, yeah, so basically St. Maud stars Morfid Clark as um, a young palliative care nurse called mm. Maud mm-hmm. who, um, who is charged with looking after... Um, a woman called Amanda, who's played by Jennifer Ely, um, who's dying, basically. And Maud is extremely pious and and thinks that, that God speaks directly to her. And through her relationship with Amanda, who's a, a former dancer whose kind of body is letting her down, um, she, she sort of begins to believe that her mission is to save Amanda's soul. And that's, that's the general gist of it. Amazing. So, first of all, what did you think? I mean, I thought it was amazing. It, it is. I've seen it twice now. Uh, it's my favourite film of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think it's absolutely extraordinary work. And this is um, this is the directorial debut of Rose Glass. And like for a first film, it is unbelievably accomplished. Like it's a very strange piece. It's frightening. It's a proper. I mean, the, we can talk about the ending later. But goodness me, the ending! Oh my god! Um, yeah. Amazing performances. I, th- I thought it was absolutely terrific honestly just amazing yeah it's stunning isn't it i feel the same way I absolutely loved it i loved it the first time i saw it i've now seen it three times and every time i think i've loved it more actually um it's really beautiful what do you think of it just from the very simple perspective as a horror film like do you do you consider it a horror film do you consider it a kind of scary horror film in the way that for example the invisible man was when we talked about that you know yeah well so i do consider it a horror, horror film mm-hmm. but Obviously, I'm a massive horror nerd, so I basically consider everything a horror. Yeah, film. Me everything too. I yeah. like is a horror film, and everything <laughs> I like isn't a proper horror. Like, that, <laughs> yeah. That's my bias. If it's good, it must be a horror film. Yeah. Uh, and I do think. I mean, I know that um, Rose has said that she doesn't necessarily consider it to be a horror film, and I don't think you know you have to. But it has definitely got, particularly towards the end, um, genre elements to it. Um, it. It's it's not scary like The Invisible Man because it's a different kind of thing, but it is very, I mean, you, you know, you have to admit, it's very unsettling. And there are scenes in it that are uh, very uncomfortable to watch. Yes. You, you'll know what I mean. But. Kind of, kind of. I guess, the, the sort of scariness of something like The Witch, I find, like where it's a kind of like bubbling sort of dread, I suppose. Yeah, or something like, of it. Um, like Killing of a Sacred Deer, mm. like in the sense that it's just got this like pervasive... Um, sense of dread to it. Mm-hmm. The settings, and I'm sure we'll go into this more later, but the settings very important. It's, it, I think it was shot in Scarborough, but it's all set in this like very faded, glamour, rundown seaside town, which is quite sort of squalid. Yes. And and you have like Maud, who's like very buttoned up, um, you know, and as, as I said, like thinks that she's communing with God, kind of navig- navigating these kind of. Um, sort of corridors and back streets and all these kind of shady people that makes you feel incredibly kind of uneasy all the way through. I know it is. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't make me want to go to Scarborough. I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's got that classic kind of. In some ways, I mean, I didn't know that it was set there until I spoke to Rose and uh, like. But it, it kind of could be any sort of run-down yeah. British seaside town, couldn't it? In a way, yeah. that sort of look. Like I grew up in a very similar-looking town in Kent, and where was that? In Folkestone. Oh right, because you know I'm from Canterbury, and then of course so I know Folkestone and Margate. As I was thinking, you know, Margate has that. Exactly. Exactly. It's got that vibe, doesn't it? Um, really yeah. kind of eerie and washed out. Um, wh- what do you think of that about just the way, I guess, the, the, the production design, that house, the backdrop, just the way this film looks? Oh, it's, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, yeah. You know, so like Amanda's house, which is this beautiful old building above everything else. Yeah. You know, and, um, and it's all about interiors and it's sort of dark inside and um, sort of rich Yes. Powerful, juxtaposed against like the outside, which is 
squalid basically mm. with these the sort of flashing lights and sort of seedy people and you know that pub scene oh, oh god ugh. yeah <laughs> and then of course Maud's apartment which is this tiny sort of like a hovel I suppose mm. like you know but it's but deliberately sparse so yeah. that it's like it's her and it's her kind of iconography um you know, like a, just a like a bare bed, mm-hmm. um, very very basic kind of stuff, and all these things kind of. I mean, the production sounds incredible, isn't it? Because it yeah. it tells you so much about the people. That's one of the things I think is so uh, accomplished about the film that it's that every part of it is joined up. I don't know whether this is making sense, but what I mean is that from the production design to the sound design, yes. to the locations, it all tells you something about the people and what's what's going on like um intellectually and spiritually yeah i totally agree with you it's like all the elements work towards this telling this story just as much as the sort of dialogue and action does i suppose don't they yeah yeah. um what do you make of maud then as a character do you like her do you sort of sympathize with her do you feel sorry for her are you terrified of her What, what do you think of her well i think one of the things that i found fascinating about her is that um she, so Rose Glass obviously is, is playing with with perceptions with her. So um, Morpheus Clark is is amazing, but Stunning. she's also yeah. incredibly slight of frame. She's very very slim and very very small, um, and it's easy to assume when somebody is slim and small that they're not strong, and that's not the case. She's indignant. Like mm. there's a scene when she uh, when she slapped Amanda which is just incredibly shocking. Like she thinks she's on a mission from God. Like you do not feel sorry for Maud. Maud mm-hmm. is this like, you know, little little wisp of a girl who needs to be protected. She's this like absolute kind of missionary. She's, you know, she's this kind of warrior woman in a yeah. tiny nurse's uniform. So, you know, so you do sort of feel quite afraid of her mm-hmm. at points and what she's capable of. And yes, and of course you feel... Well, you sort of feel sorry for her, but you sort of, but she almost, another great thing about the performance is that she almost doesn't allow you to feel sorry for her. And, you know, that I think that makes for a much richer character. Yeah, I agree. I love that. And, and again, you kind of see different shades to her and I kind of feel differently about her each time I watch it as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that all of that kind of that piousness, that religious iconography always works quite well for horror doesn't it I think for some reason that kind of stuff and I I asked Rose Glass this and you probably spoke to her about this too and I I'm I'm sure she's probably been asked this a lot about about kind of the 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 religious stuff in this film and she said you know a lot of people have asked her is this film kind of anti-religion anti-Christianity anti-Catholicism because of the way Maud sort of interprets religion I suppose um Mm. what what did you think of kind of that whole side of it the sort of spiritual side of it I suppose and and the use of kind of religious iconography in the film and all of that yeah I mean I'd be quite interested to know what she said to you actually about that because I I mean I think I don't know I thought I thought it was very interesting and I and it certainly didn't seem a a positive thing but this is a mental health story to me so Yes. I don't. I don't think it is necessarily coming down one way or another on religion because it kind of isn't about religion. That's almost the conduit for her that she thinks mm. she speaks to God, and she has this like, you know, personal, almost like sexual relationship with with God. But that, but that's not real, or yeah. certainly in my interpretation, that's not real. So like, you know, her need to punish herself and like some of those things were so uncomfortable. That kind of level of piety and that kind of level of self. Flagula- flagellation um what that felt like to me is that maud is is abandoning her body yeah to be entirely spiritual like like she sort of hates her body um and, yeah. and, and that sort of we can talk about later but that sort of links back to a thing that we understand has happened in her past and so so her complete re- rejection of her physicality in yeah. favor of her spiritual side is a sort of a, a side effect of some sort of mental health issues. I, in my mind, that's... That's, yeah, I completely agree with you. I guess, first and foremost, it is just a psychological horror film, really, it's... isn't it? More than anything else. We're so in in yeah. Maud's perspective, aren't we? And in Maud's mind, in a way, I suppose. That kind of inner mind. Yeah, so we are. It's complete. So the whole film is from Maud's perspective, actually. Mm. Like, And so that really manifests later, doesn't it? When she's 
yes sort of imagining things. things yeah 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 um let me quickly ask you about jennifer ely as well then as amanda um, and like th- those two have such a brilliant dynamic don't they and i was like this is a, like i don't really know jennifer ely that well in that many things but i remember her from like pride and prejudice in the 90s and stuff yeah. like that and like seeing her in this role i was like this is amazing um what do you think of that character of amanda and, and that sort of dynamic i suppose that maud and amanda have yeah i mean it's perfect isn't it because you have amanda who's someone who is incredibly connected to her body. You know, mm-hmm. she was a dancer and she's like a very kind of sensual person and and her body is failing her. So she's in constant pain and Maud has to help her like with these this sort of physiotherapy and this sort of thing. Um, and of course, she, you know, she was once very beautiful and yeah. all the way through we see her um, like drinking and smoking and having sex. And mm-hmm. it, it's all these things that are kind of almost connected to the concept of of sin but mm-hmm. also the concept of physicality so she's she's this kind of wonderful um earthly woman um yeah who, who's who is dying and so wants to have her friends around and wants to have her lover around and Maud is like the opposite and she can't she can't bear it so like you've got they're, they're like these these brilliant sort of opposites one who is so deeply connected to her body but her body's letting her down and the other who is utterly rejecting her body even though it isn't you know yeah i I love that about it and there is so much there's such a kind of it fits really well with this kind of um sort of series of episodes that i'm doing on the podcast about sort of horror that deals with the mind and the body and the the ones that kind of interconnect the two right i mean this movie does kind of tick all those boxes in a way there's some quite gross body horror too (laughs) yeah exactly yeah i think there are elements of body horror and Mm. elements of spiritual horror horror and elements of psychological horror so yeah yeah, it's perfect for your it is um let me ask you i mean obviously like i was talking to rose glass about what it was like growing up as a a female horror fan and and how whether or not it was there were certain films that she was able to connect with better than others and that kind of thing and i just wondered what it's like from your perspective does it make any difference at all or maybe it doesn't that this film was was made by a woman and can you tell that when you watch this for the first time and does it add anything to you as a as a female horror fan yeah i mean it's an interesting one. Um, so from my perspective, simply as a viewer yeah. uh, and a female one, this film feels very female to me. Interesting. It, it does. Um, I don't think, so But to clarify, it's not a feminist film, but it doesn't have to be. It's not yeah. not feminist. It just isn't, that's just not what it is. It's just, yeah. you know, I'm not suggesting it should be. It's not, that's not, you know, but I do, but I feel, I really personally felt like it was a very feminine film in that, it is it is two women's stories and particularly things like um that pub scene which i found utterly god just upsetting mm-hmm. um that felt incredibly female and I, I don't but the trouble is i can't be both so i don't know i don't know what that film would look like if it was made by a man and i don't know what i would think if i was a man and i don't know if like i don't know robert eggers made this film maybe he has similar experiences of that moment being that girl in that pub at that point and and feeling the male gaze and but also just how incredibly uncomfortable she is like maybe that is a universal thing i just i don't know but like i i also spoke with her about that and she was kind of like well i just happen to be a woman and it's not deliberately that and that's fair but to me just as a viewer um the way that it is a the way she talks about the female body felt very female you know mm-hmm. like to me to me i mean what did you think no, I, I mean, I don't know what I thought, really. It's hard for me to say in a way, but I, I was just interested to hear what you thought about that because I remember, I think we've discussed before, you had a similar thing with uh, Raw, right, as well. And I've spoken to a lot of people that had a, a, th- a similar thing with Raw where it's like there, there was just that slight, e- even more maybe connection with it as a woman, maybe. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but do, it, it, yeah. is it a similar sort of thing to that? Well, well Raw is about me, so no. <laughs> um, <laughs> St. Maud, is not, St. Maud is not about me, but Raw, Raw spoke to something very specific in me. Um, and so whether, I mean, it obviously it is written directed by a woman, but it talked about something that I didn't really know how to talk about that I think is female. Or even if it isn't female, it's not something that gets talked about a lot. So horror, like, horror is, is, the, is the greatest because horror is the place where we talk about the things that we don't really it's not really okay to talk about 
And like, historically, that's manifest in, well, because, because historically lots of horror is male. We, we see quite a lot of horror films about the, the things that blokes don't really want to talk about and don't really want to think about that can be expressed in this space. So it's like a safe space to talk about your dark things that aren't, you know, it's not real, it's not people being bad people, but it's just these little areas of like terror and fantasy and whatever. And, I, and Raw felt like a, a female version of that. It felt like here are some things that I don't really know how to, to talk about or to express that definitely do go on in my head. And here it is on screen, there you go. Like, oh, oh thanks very much. Um, but like Maud, um, Maud didn't feel like that to me. But I, but I, but I do think that, I mean, I'm, I think it was a really interesting story. So I think that massively appealed to me. I, I think, you know, I do like, I do like seeing like female stories on screen. I, I, I can't help that. I quite like seeing representations of women and good ones, you know, and then this, and also this is a particular kind of horror, isn't it? So like, this is, you know, this is, I, I know we don't like the term, but it's, this is your elevated horror that you'd be lumping in with things like the witch and, um, you know, and your hereditaries and your rules and all that sort of thing. It is exactly arty horror, isn't it? Arty horror. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move into a sort of more spoilery chat next, then. But finally, then, just to just to finish it off, I mean, to ask you a kind of simple question to finish with: Would you recommend this to to anyone and everyone out there, horror fans out there? Should they go and check this out? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And like, if you feel safe, um, I would say that it is definitely worth the cinematic experience. Like, it is. It's such a great looking movie. It is so immersive. Um, and the ending is so extraordinary in a cinema that, you know, I mean, obviously I know that it's a terrible time and, you know, I completely get that a lot of people don't feel safe and that's absolutely legit. But if you are someone who does and you get a chance, like this is absolutely terrific as a movie. It like, really is my favourite film of the year. It's just fantastic. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's 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 really wonderful, isn't it? And I hope enough people do get to see it, given the current situation and everything, because yeah. it is worth it. And like you say, it is an incredible kind of cinematic experience, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, the first time I saw it was in cinema. Second second time I saw it was a screening, like a, a in, on my telly, and mm. it's still brilliant on the telly. It's yeah. just, it's just if you can see it on a big screen. Totally. And actually, let me just quickly ask you as well, because we didn't mention the sound design and the music in this film. I find it really powerful, actually. And actually watching it, um, I I remember feeling that in the cinema, but also watching it at home with headphones on. I really noticed it as well. It's uh, it's quite overwhelming, the sound design, isn't it? Yes, it it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it all adds to that sort of kind of unease and Mm -hmm. like sort of slightly oppressive feeling. The only thing it sort of reminded me of very slightly the film is not like this at all, but um, is the soundtrack to, to Snowtown. That Ooh, yeah. has a similar thing where it's it's almost a little bit too much at points. You're like... Ugh. 100% agree. I feel the same way. It also reminded me a bit of um, Ben Wheatley's Kill List as well. That same kind of... That sort of pulsing drone in the background as well that kind yeah. of really made you feel horrible <laughs> um okay we're gonna roll into our spoilerific discussion then now for patreons to listen to but um first of all until then i will say thank you rosie for joining me and where can people find you and more of your work out there online yeah so well i'm the uk editor of den of geek so come on over to den of geek you can read my five star review of saint maud uh, Love it. and there'll be an interview with rose glass going up on the site uh as well um and you can find me on twitter at rosarella fletch uh, sometimes banging on about sink mode um, and other times not. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my brilliant guests, the two Roses, Rosie Fletcher and Rose Glass. And don't forget, if you want to hear the rest of my conversation with Rosie Fletcher, in which we discuss the nitty gritty spoilerific details of the film, particularly that incredible final act, then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's it for now though, but please do keep your eyes peeled for more upcoming bonus content because there's quite a lot of good stuff coming out in October. Join us again very soon for another bonus episode of The Evolution of Horror. <laughs>